cellular transport. Learn the role that the cell membrane plays when transporting material in and out of the cell. Here we see that word again, homeostasis. Let's give an overview of what you're going to learn. All organisms need to stay and regulate their internal conditions, whether they're a single cell or many cells. Internal stability is the key. When internal stability is maintained, or at least things kind of stay within a range of tolerance, we call that dynamic equilibrium. Living systems have a range of tolerance. There's never really one specific range. Some are more tolerable than other. But if we take a look at these three examples right here, pH, temperature, and even blood sugar, there can be a range in the middle of where an organism kind of tolerates it. On one side, their body can be too acidic, and on another side, it could be too basic. But falling within a tolerable range keeps any organism within a dynamic equilibrium. Same with temperature. Sometimes things can be way too hot for an organism or even way too cold, but there's a range of temperatures that organisms can tolerate, or humans and blood sugar as another good example. Your blood sugar has a range of, of tolerance. On one end, you could be hypoglycemic, or on another end, you could be hyperglycemic. But in between there, there are multiple tolerance levels. Organisms are constantly taking in stimuli, and they have to respond to it in order to maintain homeostasis. So a stimulus is change in the environment, something that is changing. And a response is the change that happens in the organism as a result of whatever stimulus happened in the environment. Feedback mechanisms evolve to help maintain homeostasis in organisms you know, as they respond to that stimuli. These are mechanisms that use an output of a system to signal a change and an input so that that system can respond to that change or respond in a way that can stabilize the organism or be amplified. So every system has a homeostasis and every system has some sort of output. That output will in turn cause some sort of input, which an input will be put back into the system. And this can be a positive or a negative feedback mechanism. Let me give you an example. A typical example of negative feedback would be the human body and its regulation of its body temperature. We are endotherms. When our body temperature rises above a normal state, the brain signals various organs, including your skin, to release heat in the form of sweat. The sweat then cools down our body and our body is brought back to normal. That is what we call a negative feedback. In negative feedback, things also tend to fix themselves, if you will. A great example of a positive feedback is global warming. Global warming, or climate change, as it occurs, it creates this change in the environment. And those changes, usually the distribution of more gases, more greenhouse gases, speed up the warming process of the Earth. That speeding up of the warming process of the Earth creates more climate change. And so it's constantly feeding into itself. So a feedback mechanism that's positive, it's where the output or the product of the system kind of intensifies the response. There's an amplification, like childbirth. You have hormones that instigate childbirth, that those hormones instigate contractions, that tractions, the contractions cause pressure, and that pressure releases more hormones, which in then turn causes more contractions, which causes more pressure, or fruit ripening. Fruit ripens, and when it ripens, it releases an ethylene gas. That ethylene gas signals all of the fruit around it to go ahead and ripen. So then all the neighboring fruit starts to ripen, which releases more ethylene gas, which causes even more fruit to go ahead and start ripening. And this is why when you're looking for berries at the grocery store, and if you pick up one box of strawberries and you look at it and it's super moldy, chances are everyone's moldy. 
because they've already talked to themselves through ethylene gas on the way to the grocery store. Negative feedback looks, it's when the output or the product of a system is kind of in counter response or it returns back to the system. We would call that stabilization. It's not always a, you know, a plus factor here as far as feedback, but you can think about it like body temperature and how the human body temperature does thermoregulation or water concentration, osmoregulation, or blood sugar regulations. These are typically how the body does a negative feedback loop. And the human thermoregulation, it's talking about just regular old um, body temperature. It's not talking about the increasing your body temperature and sweating example that I gave you before. Now it's the cell membrane's job to maintain homeostasis through maintaining like regulation of all organ systems in a level that is all the way down on, on the cell itself. So much of the homeostasis in the cellular level is really maintained by the cell membrane, the fluid mosaic model, if you will, from what we talked about before. And that cell membrane, it controls the movement of things in and out of the cell. So here, if you take a look right here, we're taking the cell membrane part and blowing it up. Here we have the phospholipid bilayer. There's your phosphate heads and the fatty acid tails. And you see these protein channels that allow things to kind of come in and out of the cell. And then you also see receptors. And what this membrane is doing through its series of channels, and of course using um, the polar polar section and you know non-polar section of it uh, to regulate whatever it is that's coming in and out of the cell it's almost like a, a barrier things can get in but they've got to have a purpose they have to be special they either have to have the right key or the right shape or they have to have permission the cell membrane is selectively permeable which means it's picky about what goes in and out Things can pass easily, usually things that are very small, nonpolar, hydrophobic molecules, and or they're usually neutral in a sense, um, and even most of the time water. So not everything can pass through the membrane, or at least not easily. Things that are polar or very large molecules can't just pass straight through the membrane. They got to have some sort of like gate or um, chemical signal that'll just sink them and pull them in. So the transportation of materials in and out of the cell is classified either as a active or an active type of situation. If it can easily pass through here because it's really, really tiny, for example, that's a passive. It doesn't require any energy. If it's going to require some amount of energy, then we're going to call that an active transport. So passive transport requires no extra energy by the cell. And this is because things move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The molecules want to spread themselves out easily. And so it moves down what we call a concentration gradient. Things like simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis, the diffusion of water. Active transport requires extra energy, that ATP molecule, to be spent in order to bring materials in or out of the cell. In order for the cell to expel materials out, things have to move from a low concentration to a high concentration gradient. So they're moving against a concentration gradient. These are things like molecular pumps, endo and exocytosis. Think about passive transport this way. If I'm in one corner of the room and you're in the other corner, and I spray some stinky perfume. You're not gonna smell it right away. You're currently in an area of low concentration. Where I'm standing where I sprayed the stinky perfume, and that's an area of high concentration. Well, the molecules, they want to diffuse out. And so eventually you are going to smell the stinky perfume standing far away. Because the molecules are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. They're wanting to spread out. Active transport 
requires physical energy to move those molecules. When we talk about diffusion or osmosis regulation, there's a few words to know. This must be from like physical science or even maybe from an earth science class you might have had. A solute, that's what's getting dissolved. Okay, that's like the lemonade powder that gets dissolved inside of the water. The water is the solvent. That's what's doing all the dissolving. Together, they form a solution, a relatively uniform mixture of these two substances. Now, how much solute I put in gives me a concentration. So I can make the lemonade more tart, if I like, by putting more powder in. I can increase the concentration of solute in the solution. Usually this is abbreviated by brackets. A concentration amount will oftentimes have brackets around it. That's how you know they're talking about the concentration of something and not a numerical measurement of something else. A concentration gradient is the difference in the concentration of substances from one location to another. And like I said, passive transport kind of moves from that high concentration to low concentration. It's flowing from one location to another, moving down a concentration gradient.